Thank you so much for that introduction. It's an honor to be here. I'm going to be speaking about data and scholarship and some of the magnificent developments made possible in the digital environment. Uh, developments that have potential to change the way scholarship is developed, the way knowledge is used, organized, and shared. This can create new forms of scholarly communication and speaks very much to what Stephen mentioned in his keynote talk about computing back and the importance of data. In this context, I'm going to be talking about data as it pertains specifically to scholarship. And I'm going to be describing a tool called RMAP that can facilitate this kind of communication. Um, so let's think about the pre-digital time for a while and how data was connected to scholarship. This is Diderot's encyclopedia from the 1700s. I love the Beatles. Um, it was bounded and discreet. This could create challenges for scholarship over the long haul, of course. Um, let's go into a little story about Gregor Mendel, the father of genetics, or maybe thought of as the father of pea pods, who analyzed about 29,000 pea pods, pea plants, to develop his uh, theory of inheritance, dominant and recessive genes. Mendel published his findings in 1865. They were ignored, another scientist well before his time. Um, some decades later, in 1900, they were rediscovered. And some decades after that, in the 1930s, a scholar published an article questioning Mendel's data, saying that it seemed too good to be true. Remarkably, in the past 50 years, there have been over 50 articles exploring issues about Mendel's data. But controversies surrounding the data can't be resolved because Mendel's notebooks are missing. They were thought to have been burned. So in the pre-digital form environment, data, of course, was stored in analog format. Data always has been observed and summarized but it was stored in vast repositories. Some of our great museums, the Smithsonian here in town, the Museum of Natural History, of course, there's always a need to store physical objects. The rise of digital publishing is a game changer in this environment. We go from these temples of information, that's Trinity Library Dublin, absolutely gorgeous, um, housing information scholarship as bounded, and discrete. That's the nature of analog information, as incredible as it can be. We transition to the digital environment where we have vast repositories of scholarly articles, um, creating all sorts of opportunities, repositories like JSTOR, part of my organization. The rise of digital publishing has been remarkable. We all know that in the past 20 years, um, what we've seen in digital publishing has been astronomical. Uh, Association of American Publishers survey found that 94% of journals surveyed are available in digital format. Over half of library budgets, acquisition budgets, are for ebooks. So we're dealing with a new format for scholarship. And that new format enables a different notion of publishing with an impact on scholarship that's immeasurable. It opens up an entirely new world for scholarship. We've seen that scholars expand the role of data in their research as data has moved, as Stephen talked about in his incredible keynote, data has moved from analog to digital and along that continuum then to computable. This is really within that space of between digital and computable. What happens there with relationships between data and scholarship? Scientists are generating more data, not just scientists, everybody's, everything is generating more data. Um, and publishing in digital format creates opportunities for more dynamic use of data. 
So we can see some examples of in this post-analog environment where data is not necessarily lost, the kinds of ways in which data can be repurposed and reused. Um, we're in Washington, so we can talk politics a little bit. You may remember a few years ago Paul Ryan's budget, which posited, posited that public, high public debt stifles economic growth. That was based on economic research. When those economists shared their research with scholars, the scholars found a coding error in the data that led them to determine that actually the opposite finding was true, that significant public debt does not stifle growth. Nathan Mirvold, when he's not running Microsoft or making cookbooks, um, went back and studied paleontology data and determined that dinosaurs didn't grow that fast or as fast as had been thought. So what happens when data is not lost, when it persists, offers remarkable opportunities for ongoing conversation and dialogue. This creates a scholarly record that is not static. It becomes mutable and dynamic. Very different from that slide I showed you earlier of the library with its gorgeous structure and its beautiful books, but that was static. What this can lead to is a new view of the scholarly record. Instead of taking a top-down approach, we can take a bottom-up approach. What's a top-down approach? A top-down approach is the article as the entry point into understanding things. And in the past, articles would have included figures, tables, charts, graphs, but those were disaggregated from the underlying data. What happens when data is connected to scholarship and the entry point can become different? How does this change the difference in how information is collected, how it's used, how it's created, and how knowledge is created? We end up with a very new, uh, very dynamic environment, something that is quite exciting. The scholarly record becomes more dynamic and less bounded. Once upon a time, uh, digital artifacts and scholarship were more or less discrete objects. Now we're seeing that the article is evolving into a multi-part distributed object. I'm going to say that again because it's so important. Think of a scholarly article as a multi-part distributed object. The new article contains building blocks that consist of text, graphics, and data. Some of these reside in different repositories. They're, they're maintained by different institutions and employ different technologies. This creates evolving relationships between the building blocks that need to be preserved. If you have the article in one place and the data in another, charts, graphs, how do these relate to each other? How do we really capitalize on the wonderful potential of the digital environment? Well, this creates um, very dynamic changes in digital publishing. Um, you know, there's greater expectations for connections between publications and data. Um, and increasingly, importance of collaboration among a number of stakeholders that formerly maybe could have existed a lot more independently. That includes publishers, data centers, pre preservation services, and a need for tools to, to serve these, these interests. Um, there's a need for new intermediaries. How often have we heard about that in the digital environment? That even though there might be content creators, even though there might be, you know, organizations and individuals that produce data, there's a need for different types of intermediaries to connect these. And again, Stephen touched on this in his keynote when he was talking about being able to compute back and, and look at data and some of the work that Wolfram is doing. Um, so there's a new interest in not just preserving the publications and data, but actually preserving the relationship between and among these so that they don't get lost. 
think about what data mapping looks like now. This is um, the linked open data cloud. It's a huge, huge. Data is everywhere. How do we connect, find the right place where uh, data can connect to scholarship? So there are problems with connecting data to scholarship. Um, it's not unusual even for scholars to put their data on a hard drive or put it in a university repository where it isn't really curated. We've heard that word a lot this morning, and it's a very important word in this context. So we've grown accustomed to being able to read papers um, with figures and, and statistics, but being able to actually get to the underlying data is quite challenging. You know, there are broader systematic challenges. Um, for example, funding for research. Should grant funders be funding just research or actually managing the output of research? That's really a shift in thinking about what the funding goals are. Organizational structures. Um, historically, uh, there's been a lot of siloing. Data management challenges these silos. Silos such as the world of faculty versus administration versus IT, the library, the business side of these. All of these areas are stakeholders in data management and need to figure out ways to collaborate. Professional preparation. Are scholars being adequately trained in the importance of data management and curation? Priority among researchers. Researchers are rewarded for new research, not necessarily for managing pre-existing research. Even institutional mandates, the notion of large-scale data sharing of cumulative sets of research to advance a larger research agenda is a relatively new concept. It bumps up against certain institutional restrictions even, like IRB review. Um, you know, some, some institutions can't share certain data. Some data is subject to more restrictions. There have been a few efforts to improve data management on an administrative side. Um, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, I know we have someone in the room who has been there too, who could speak in greater detail to this, but issued, um, called for uh, fund, funded agencies to have data management policies. The NIH um, has initiated policy. Other, other agencies have joined in on that. Um, these efforts have had the desired effect of focusing and galvanizing the government, educational, and private sector to build an infrastructure for publishing and data. Um, there are some examples, too, of efforts. The OAI, that's the Open Archives Initiative, ORE, Object Reuse and Exchange, has developed the concept of resource maps. Um, you're going to hear that word, that phrase, a little bit more in this talk. Um, resource maps, information graphs that describe aggregations of data um, and publications and the relationships between them. The private sector has proprietary information graphs. Google, Amazon, and Facebook. Again, Stephen touched on some of these. And it looks like Wolfram, too, is developing its own way of connecting and mapping data to um, scholarships to enable computing back. Even with these wonderful efforts, there are some limitations. Um, you know, there are preservation needs in connection with those relationships. Um, relationships can change over time. So how can that relationship be preserved and an understanding of that relationship to be preserved? Also, the scholarly community has certain unique requirements um, that can be developed, um, that can complement some of these other efforts. So introduce the RMAP project. This is a collaboration between the Data Conservancy out of Johns Hopkins and some other institutions, Portico, which is a digital preservation service that's a part of Ithaca, the organization I'm affiliated with, and IEEE. It's funded by the Alfred Sloan Foundation. The goal of the RMAP project is to, the, is to preserve publications, their underlying data, 
and the relationship of text graphs, other elements that at present reside in different repositories maintained by different institutions using different technologies. This project builds on the work of OAI, ORE, um, and um, moves forward in other ways. It's expected to be released in the spring of 2016. There have been some antecedents to the RMAP project. A good example is Archive, which allowed for authors to submit articles. Um, Archive collaborated with the Data Conservancy, also part of RMAP. Um, the authors could submit papers and their data could be submitted to the Data Conservancy and then a bi-directional link established the connection. So that was a great example of enabling scholarship to connect to data. There are some challenges, lack of metadata is a problem and also preservation issues, preservation of the link itself and preservation of the data. There have been other projects, some of these connect data to publications, some of these are more focused on simply connecting, making sure that data about different aspects of publications are understood. Somebody, um, we have a speaker here from ORCID who will be speaking tomorrow that focuses a lot on um, the data about the authors and other aspects of publishing. So there's a lot of conversation happening now in this area. RMAP advances the state of the art in certain specific ways. It captures many to many relationships. Instead of that bi-directional link that we saw with archive, the, the idea is to understand that it's a very broad and very dynamic environment. And there can be data and more data and even more data relating to a certain article. Preserving um, the notion of preserving the connection between the data and the publications is also very important. So frequently, those connections are lost. Scholars move to new institutions, repositories forget that they have certain data, the data isn't curated. Also, the notion that this is multidisciplinary. Disciplines have their own idiosyncrasies. They're there for certain reasons, but they also can make it difficult to have a comprehensive view. And there can be instances in which data from one discipline is actually relevant to another discipline. So I'd like to talk a moment about some practical aspects of this, like what are some of the actual usage scenarios, because ultimately the RMAP project aims to serve a very practical function. It can have an impact for scholarly authors, it can have an impact for publishers, it can have an impact for repositories of information, because it will connect publications, data, and research, and expose and preserve those connections. This can enable new forms of scholarly communication, research, and digital publishing. So take, for example, an author submitting a paper to a publisher. The author can submit the data set and also have the RMAP tool mint a resource map, remember that term resource map, between the data and the article, and that link will be preserved. Forever, they can be joined at the hip. Another example is a publisher receiving an article, saying, gee, I wonder what antecedents there are to this. Are there other data sets that we should be aware of? The publisher can look to our map and determine what the resource maps are to other data sets that relate to the article. Yet another example is a, a journal archive. Portico is a dark archive. It exists to ensure publications are preserved in the event a, a publisher goes out of business, when that content is then triggered. So uh, research publications that may have been dark archived for a very long time, if they are triggered, it might be useful to understand what some of the newer developments are, what data sets relate to those publications. Those don't need to be lost simply because that article was sleeping for a long time in a dark archive. Another example is replicating research and the value that brings. Um, imagine 
seeing a published article and be able to say, huh, was that accurate? I mean, it's scary for, for researchers themselves, too, who are publishing, but it allows for much more transparency of data and opens it up. Even with the wonderful prospects of RMF, there will be some continuing challenges. Um, funding for data management is always a challenge. Also, quality of data, if various data sets are going to be mapped to the, um, to the, publish, to the publication, how do we know that the quality is good? And also confidentiality. Again, some institutions, if it's involving human subjects and all, there could be restrictions and issues on how that data is shared. But the main takeaway is that what we're seeing since the theme of this conference is the Internet of Things, the notion of the scholarly article becoming a connected object, a multi-part distributed object with link connections to its data, creating a vibrant environment for scholarship, a new form of communication which really sets the stage for the future of research and publishing. So I'll end by saying I think that what this ultimately leads to is the end of conclusions because data can be reviewed, data can be analyzed and reanalyzed and supplemented, and we can end up with this bottom-up view of scholarship, not simply a top-down view of scholarship. Thank you.